Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Bruce County Public Library for this live presentation. My name is Nancy Cool, and I'm the program coordinator for Bruce County Public Library. And today you can see we have a very, very busy screen. Um, so we welcome Keith Reed from ALICE, which stands for Alternate Land Use Services. And representing uh, Stewardship Gray Bruce, we have Joanne Harbinson, the Manager of Water Resources for Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority, and Nora Toth, the Chair and steward of Stewardship Gray Bruce and the Piping Plover Committee. So before we get started, just a few little housekeeping items. Uh, while listening and watching today, we encourage you to submit any questions or comments to our web form on the Bruce County Public Library website. And you should be able to see the link on our screen here or in the comments during the presentation. Um, so we, uh, we welcome any questions that you might have and then we'll address any questions following the presentation. Uh, you may also wish to take this opportunity to grab a pen and paper to jot down any programs or ideas or points of reference that uh, are of interest to you. If you don't get a chance to watch live today, uh, this presentation will be recorded and posted here on the library's YouTube channel in our special guest playlist. Uh, you will find the recording there so you can watch it later and share it with your fam friends and family. And if you haven't already, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep up to date with all our live presentations because they are all fabulous. Uh, following the presentation, we encourage you to fill in our short evaluation form. Your feedback and stories help show the value uh, in what the library does in our community. So we really appreciate your feedback. Uh, so to begin today, uh, we'll start with a short video that provides an overview of stewardship Gray Bruce, and then we'll uh, go into our presentations. So uh, let's start off with the video. Stewardship Gray Bruce encourages individuals and local groups to be good stewards by planning and managing the natural resources on their land in a responsible manner. We are a not-for-profit, volunteer-based, community-oriented organization. Our board members are from Gray Bruce and have many local interests, backgrounds and skills. We form partnerships with natural resources related community organizations to link landowners with information on best practices, expertise and modest resources for a wide range of environmental initiatives. Become a stewardship ambassador. Participate in our soil and water stewardship program where soil health and water quality projects such as cover crops, buffer plantings and grass waterways are encouraged. As a plover lover at Sobble Beach, you engage and educate beachgoers so that they better understand the endangered piping plover and this bird's habitat requirements. Stewardship Gray Bruce has collaborated with local conservation authorities and municipalities to complete such projects as the rehabilitation of Silver Creek in Walkerton, as well as a number of stream bank tree planting projects throughout the counties. We believe that fostering an appreciation for nature and natural resources gives youth in Bruce Gray the tools to become Ontario's future green leaders. As a result, we volunteer at and support the Gray Bruce Children's Water Festival, Roots of Bruce and Grown in Gray, Bruce Gray Forest Festival, the Youth Outdoors Expo and Envirothon. As a landowner or community group, do you have a stewardship project or an environmentally focused event? Stewardship Gray Bruce may be able to provide modest sponsorship or connect you to the right resources. Our overall goal, to create a healthy, vibrant and sustainable community through empowered citizens, natural resources stewardship and partner collaboration. So let's uh, get a little bit more into this and we'll, st uh, we'll begin with Keith Reed. Uh, Keith was raised on a century farm consisting of beef, uh, cattle and sheep. And there with his family, he gained his passion and love for agriculture. Uh, Keith has attended the University of Guelph and graduated with a diploma in agriculture. And he has worked on a variety of farm operations and currently with his wife and three small children, they operate their own farm consisting of beef, cattle, sheep, crops, and hay. And in 2012, Keith was encouraged to come on board with the Gray County Agricultural Services Center um, to, insist, to assist in launching the 
a new source of environmental stewardship funding to Gray and Bruce farmers. Alice, uh, known ALUS, known as Altern Alternative Land Use Services, is a voluntary environmental stewardship program and provides funding to farmers who are interested in establishing ecological services on their marginal farm landscapes. As the Alice Gray Bruce Program Coordinator, he has facilitated 720 acres of new stewardship projects across Gray and Bruce counties, and we are looking forward to hearing more uh, about your projects. Keith. Welcome. Excellent. Thanks, Nancy. You can hear me okay? Um, Sounds yeah, good. So, so uh, again, uh, uh, thanks again for the opportunity to speak here today and uh, to tell you a little bit about what the ALICE program is. So, um, as you see, it's the Weston Family Initiative. So, um, we are sponsored by um, corporate dollars as well as uh, uh, government funding um, and uh, other sources that uh, that can provide uh, startup costs and uh, annual payments for acreages that are taken out of production. Um, so we're, the tagline there is sustaining agriculture, wildlife and natural spaces for all Canadians, one acre at a time. Uh, and again, we're out of uh, Gray Agricultural Services Centre in Markdale um, and we encompass the two counties. So the current marketplace uh, does not reward farmers for doing the right things environmentally and Alice is a tool that does that. Um, so what that means is, uh, that's from John McQuarrie, a Deputy Minister of PEI. Um, what that means is, uh, you know, we can actually show um, that there is a benefit that we can um, do for climate, for uh, cleaning air, cleaning water, um, and uh, all of the things that uh, can be provided on the landscape uh, can happen through uh, farmers and agriculture producers. And uh, so we are um, in a in very unique position to do, to do that. Um, this is uh, from 1934. So Adol, although Leopold said, conservation will ultimately boil down to rewarding the private landowner who conserves the public interest. So. Um, so we, uh, you know, we're put in a very unique position as uh, one of the largest landowners um, uh, worldwide, probably. Um, Alice Canada is expanding and has expanded over the last uh, quite a few years. Um, in Ontario alone, there's eight communities. Uh, we have Lambton, uh, Peterborough, uh, Elgin, one of the oldest communities is Norfolk, uh, Middlesex, and uh, Gray and Bruce uh, is, is one of them as well. So um, expanding uh, big in the west, actually, this is an older map, but it, uh, it does show um, that we are uh, nationwide. So um, what are ecosystem services and, and what does that mean? Um, and what can farmers do um, to provide ecosystem services? Um, and, and what, what really are they and what do they entail? So uh, there's a list of 10, I won't go through them all um, indirectly, but uh, you know, carbon sequestration is a big one where um, you know, we can be put in the driver's seat as to, um, uh, to sequester carbon on the, on the landscape. Um, at the end of the day, the biggest one is probably adding biodiversity to the landscape um, and a very important one as well. Uh, water filtration, uh, the importance of water and the importance of clean water. Um, pollinator habitat, I think that's one that can uh, resonate with most um, and in talks of uh, um, the uh, pollinator uh, collapse, the, uh, it's definitely an issue. And uh, by creating habitat, that's something that we can, uh, can provide benefit to. Uh, erosion con control, uh, very large uh, one on, on erosion control as well. Species at risk habitat, uh, flood control, uh, drought mitigation, climate adaptation. Um, you know what happened on on the landscape. Uh, you know can have ultimately an, an effect on on everyone. So, uh, and uh, building community resilience, and you'll see that through this pre presentation as well. So, Alice provides annual payments to ensure the ongoing stewardship of each project. Um, so some communities and, and Alice is calling them maintenance payments. Um, so typically some of the other programs where, um, you know, have startup costs or a cost share basis, uh, which is Alice as well. Um, but by taking acres out of production, um, Alice's vision is that um, as a 
as a project matures, it gets better and uh, ecosystem services that's provided actually does um, does does get better. So we encourage these projects to to be implemented and maintained. Again, um, you know, agriculture has uh, a, a big footprint and uh, it can be seen as negative, but it can also be seen as, um, you know, uh, by doing these projects, we can uh, we can tell consumers that, um, you know, What's happening on 100 acres in Bruce County that you own uh, can have uh, an, a, a positive effect uh, to everyone involved. Um, you know, some of the statistics of agriculture and uh, are interesting. 98% of Canadian farms are family owned and operated. Um, agriculture is not just a business, but a way of life for many Canadian families. Um, we're seeing such a, a, a change in how. Uh, agriculture um, is within each community. We're seeing um, lots of changes. Um, and uh, I think through COVID, uh, you know, we can also uh, point out that uh, we're basically a frontline worker as well, where uh, the work that we do is is on an ongoing basis and needs to be done uh, for for everyone, uh, for everyone's survival. Um, Alice uh, is successful in in each community because of the eight Alice principles that we um, that we have. Um, what is what is an environmental uh, issue in Gray and Bruce may not be completely um, the same in Manitoba or even uh, when we look at Norfolk County. Uh, you know we have different um, different issues of the day and. Uh, by using these principles, it allows each community to uh, to allow um, flexibility and and, uh, and how that community goes about their um, Alice projects. So the first uh, first of eight is uh, it's community developed. Um, so we have a, a, a PAC, which is our partnership advisory committee. Um, it is made up of um, conservation authorities. Um, the reason I'm here today is is uh, through uh, stewardship, Gray Bruce. So community involvement um, is important to to everyone. Um, so when it's developed within a community, like I said, it's uh, able to take on its own um, its own uh, agenda as far as as what's happening locally. Um, Part of those, uh, the people that, that are part of the pack, which uh, make the decisions on where the, the funding goes, um, is farmer led and, and delivered. So 50% of our pack is made up of farmers. Um, I'm a farmer myself, so I'm the kind of the face that, um, that puts projects in. Um, so we have the ability to, um, you know, to, to, to be on the ground um, and, and helping implement these projects. Um, at the local level. Um, number three is it's targeted. Um, it's targeted to marginal land. So um, we're not in the business of taking good farmland out of production uh, because of the importance that uh, that these acres uh, do provide obviously for food and uh, fiber. Um, but uh, by targeting these areas, these environmentally sensitive areas, um, what could be two acres on uh, you know, a hundred acre parcel um, has huge impacts when we look at if every hundred acre parcel had a small acreage tied to it. Um, so we only um, uh, provide payments up to 20% of the working farm. So if you have a hundred acre farm, uh, 20 acres would be the maximum that you could enroll. And basically for that reason of not taking good farmland data production. Um, it's market driven. Um, so uh, we're valuing those acres that are taken out of production, that they do have uh, value. And, um, um, you know, those, those uh, landowners are still paying taxes on those acres. Um, and uh, as you are probably aware, the cost of farmland is going up considerably. Um, so there's a, there's a value to, um, to, um, basically production and when we think of farmers and agriculture producers um, that's typically what we're thinking uh, it's kind of ingrained in us for production um, but this is kind of a, a different uh, take on things and we're actually providing um, uh, acres uh, and uh, providing something else with those acres 
Um, it's voluntary, um, which means uh, there's nobody uh, beating a stick saying that you have to be part of it. Um, well, we're at this point, uh, you know, producers are coming forward with projects, which is uh, which is great. Um, and uh, we're working with with producers that are wanting to be uh, part of the process. So um, there's no regulatory uh, system where we're, um, you know, making you have to do these uh, types of projects. It's on a voluntary basis. Um, number six is that we're integrated within, um, uh, like I said before, we're integrated in within um, uh, community level, but we're also integrated within um, uh, if if you're also a part of Forest Ontario or uh, you know uh, a grant from Ontario Soil and Crop, uh, Ducks Unlimited, just to name a few, um, as well as conservation authorities, um, we want to be integrated to to show that we have that partnership within um, other organizations as well. Um, and accountability, um, accountability to our funders that um, these acres that are taken out of production are correct uh, and that they're actually uh, doing uh, the, the purpose that the project intended. Um, so 10% uh, of our acres each year is um, uh, uh, basically pulled uh, and uh, there's no knowing which, which project will be pulled. Um, and then they're they're verified for acres and uh, by AcreCorp, so well recognized within the farm community. Um, and number eight, the last one is that it's science based, um, so it shows that <clears throat> that those acres and and um, projects that we're doing uh, do have a value and uh, that they are doing um, uh, basically a measurable benefit uh, to those acres that we're taking out of production. Um, so again, uh, just quickly, we'll go over the Partnership Advisory Committee. Um, like I said, it's uh, it's driven by the principles. Um, and so when we're approving these projects, I take all these projects forward uh, to the PAC, which is uh, made up of 50% of the farmers and uh, the other 50% is, is uh, basically vested interest uh, groups as well as uh, government agencies, uh, OMAFRA, uh, the three uh, FBRN um, farm business uh, uh, groups, so OFA, uh, Christian Farmers Federation of Ontario and uh, National Farmers Union. Um, these principles are guided in uh, our PAC to make those decisions. Uh, the second thing that they look for is that is is the project going to be additional? So there are there going to be extra ecosystem services provided um, than what there is there now? So um, we want to make sure that uh, the projects that we're doing are are you know taking these sensitive areas and uh, providing an extra service for them. And obviously uh, number three, which is uh, uh, kind of a no-brainer, but if the funding uh, is is available uh, to approve these projects. So just quickly run through some uh, projects that we're doing um, and what are typical on the Grey Bruce landscape. Um, we are still um, still have a lot of livestock, which uh, which makes um, a lots of exclusion fencing projects. Um, this one here is actually taking uh, a mature bush and uh, letting the cattle uh, have um, limiting the, the cattle access to the bush, um, so allowing the flora and fauna to to flourish. Um, and a lot of these mature bushes also have vernal ponds, and uh, which are important to the amphibian um, uh, ecosystem. So there's lots of benefits to uh, allowing those um, areas to regrow and, and do their thing. Um, again, this one, I, I like this picture. It shows, uh, you know, a very distinct um, side and uh, um, which side would you want to uh, have on your property is probably a a fairly uh, fairly easy answer, um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, fencing costs money, and uh, projects like this is something that I think is on the minds of most producers. Um, but it does uh, it does cost money, and it does uh, um, it does take time to uh, put these uh, projects up. So we're glad to help with uh, with projects like this. 
Um, this project is in uh, Formosa, right outside uh, Formosa, next to the Conservation Authority office uh, there. Um, so uh, this is basically uh, fencing as well, um, but a stream uh, going through. So we're limiting the cattle out of there. Um, and then we're paying on the acres then that are taken out of production. When you do fencing, there's uh, lots of crossings going in as well. Um, and so this is a pretty common site where uh, they're able to access uh, water to drink um, in a limited area and a limited spot where uh, it's appropriate to do that. Lots of tree uh, plantings uh, and working in partnership with some contractors in uh, Grand Bruce County as well as the conservation authorities are doing lots of, of tree plantings as well. Um, and uh, they're typically utilizing the Forest Ontario grant, um, which is a, a big benefit um, to the landowner. Um, and pollinator projects, uh, that's a big one too, and I kind of uh, touched on it as well earlier, um, but we are seeing, uh, have heard in the news in the past uh, about the uh, colony collapse, and um, by providing habitat, uh, we're definitely helping uh, um, helping the pollen, uh, pollinators to be uh, healthier and uh, more sustainable for sure. Um, erosion uh, control is definitely one. Uh, this is this is in uh, Bruce County, out of where the Saugeen enters in. So it's something that nobody really wants to see, but it's something that um, is in the news as well as far as uh, algal blooms. Um, and I mean that's uh, it's unfortunately the reality but there's lots of uh, lots of projects where we're um, increasing buffers um, to allow um, you know that that green canopy uh, next to a waterway or a sensitive area where we can um, uh, you know basically hold those nutrients in and uh, and, and do the, the best thing for um, just having that little bit of a buffer for the crop next to that sensitive area um, as far as uh, you know, easily visual um, visually can see of where a project would actually help locally. Um, this is actually taken in front of our, our farm a few years ago uh, when the fall weather didn't allow us to get the corn off. Um, you can see the black the black or the yellow line behind the tractor um, is the corn where it is actually holding the snow in. Um, and in front of the tractor, uh, you can see that yellow line. That's actually the height of the snow, um, which is basically the height of the tractor. Um, and that area actually was, um, had, the municipality had to blow that area back twice uh, by hiring contractors in to, uh, to do that. So um, anywhere we have, um, you know, uh, erosion issues and wind issues, um, uh, we're in a pretty susceptible area next to uh, Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, uh, where this is a, a site that uh, that has happened, and uh, we're not going reverting back to the dirty 30s and uh, applying the dust bowl rules as yet. But um, but we are you know uh, keeping a green cover uh, through soil um, uh, cover crops and, and things like that. Um, but uh, we are seeing some tree lines coming out, and that's probably the most common thing that I hear. Um, as a coordinator, um, you know, uh, why are farmers taking them out? And, the, you know, there's many reasons for that, but um, there, is, uh, there is options of taking, uh, putting some tree lines back in and, um, and the possibility of them being, um, uh, you know, better uh, suited for larger equipment, um, putting them in areas that are uh, maybe better um, for that, uh, that equipment marriage to happen. Um, so, you know, here's a uh, typical uh, Alice project in Grand Bruce where we're um, tree planting in some of the lower lying areas that was cropped and, and pasture before. Um, that was one of the first projects that we had and those trees are, are doing quite well now. Uh, this is a neat one for me um, where we are seeing some, uh, some large cash crop operations coming forward um, using technology where those areas that are showing red um, are areas that uh, might not even be um, uh, gaining the cost of production uh, in uh, in planting the seeds and putting fertilizer down. So those areas uh, are um, are something that um, uh, they're bringing out of production, and and we're seeing some tree plantings in those areas, um, which is uh, which is exciting to see. 
uh, wetland projects. Um, we've uh, done a couple, not as many as uh, tree plantings and stuff like that, exclusion fencing, but this one is uh, on Gray Road 3. Um, and some of you may have seen it where there's a sign there. Um, this is probably one of the first wetlands we did. So uh, as Nancy had said in the introduction, uh, 720 acres to date in 89 projects. So um, those are um, kind of the statistics for um, typically since uh, 2014. This is uh, my contact information and um, please feel free to reach out to me if there's any questions um, or you uh, have a project in mind. We would love to work with you. That's it, I think. So back <laughs> to you, Nancy, if I'm... Great. Yeah, no, yeah. thank you, Keith. That was excellent. It was, it's so nice to see um, uh, the work that you're doing and, and to even like recognize some of those projects in our, in our own backyards. That's fabulous. That was really, really interesting. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, so next, we're going to turn over to Joanne. Uh, Joanne's work uh, with Sogging Valley Conservation Authority and experience in environmental planning fits well with the stewardship organization. Um, Joanne shared that she is a, a University of Western Ontario graduate and is celebrating uh, a significant anniversary with the Conservation Authority this year. Uh, Joanne will focus today on stewardship Grey Bruce's support in the community for youth and the environment. Um, are you ready, Joanne? Yes, I am. Awesome, thanks. Thanks, Nancy, for the introduction as well, and, and thank you, Keith, for the, uh, the initial presentation there. And just to dovetail into that and to provide you with some information about Stewardship Grey Bruce, and our tagline is sustaining our natural resources together. The Stewardship Grey Bruce's mandate, as you can see there, is exists to create a healthy, vibrant, and sustainable community through empowering its citizens, uh, for natural resources, stewardship, and partner collaboration. There's 11 board members uh, of directors on our, on our committee, all across from Gray and Bruce counties. We are consisting of the former um, county, county stewardship councils that were under the Ministry of Natural Resources. And many of our directors have come together and we all have various backgrounds, whether related to our work, our area of interest, or just a passion for the environment. We all come together for a common goal of supporting the environment and our natural resources with a strong emphasis on our youth. Now, our core values, as you know, many not-for-profits have to set themselves up with all the information uh, to be successful in, in order to apply for funding and everything. I'm not going to go through all these core values, but we understand that there are many factors that are, that are brought together to support the youth and natural environments and supporting projects in the natural environment while meeting the needs of the community, both socially and environmentally, are very important to us. We encourage anyone listening to the presentation uh, to certainly to go to our website and find out more about our group and us, support us in your backyard by supporting the natural environment. Funding support for the stewardship of Grey Bruce comes from various sources. A number of our programs uh, we will highlight today uh, about stewardship Grey Bruce, we are truly thankful for the financial support that we do receive. As you can see there, Bruce Power, 1% for the Planet, Ontario Trillium uh, Foundation, the Ministry of Environment, um, many of those who have given us uh, some financial commitments over the years, but we also have our in-kind supporters, which as many of you know as not-for-profits, you really can't do things on your own. That is a number of bodies and committees, and we all form these partnerships together. So not just the financial uh, cash, but we do have the, our board of directors who are, are voluntary. We could not perform our duties without them and without the in-kind uh, of our organizations to continue to support the, our staff, our, our directors, and as well as club members such as the Sydney Sportsman Association. So I'm going to highlight some of the programs that we've done and one that was uh, a fairly significant one in the last few years, in 2018 to 2019 was our involvement in agriculture and our soil and water program piloting. What we did was to review all of our, all other county-wide programs for water quality improvement. We gathered community uh, specific experiences related to these incentive programs. We studied focus groups and survey data, stakeholder interviews, and we also looked at behavioral assessments resulting in a program evaluation. Uh, this pilot 
soil and water stewardship program. And so from that, and together with our partners, we were able to cover $20,000 in cover crop seed funding. So that's very really significant and also to develop uh, the pattern and the plan for moving ahead with eventual application for um, another program which will enhance uh, the Great Brewer Soil and Water Program. So our education outreach uh, with stewardship Grey Bruce has a long history and we've been doing this for a lot of years between the two councils and now the single council coming together in 2012. But annually we support many initiatives and events such as the Woodlock Conference that's held in Elmwood every year. And one of our former members, Ron Gates, up at the up on Bruce Peninsula, he would support trees uh, for the Purple Valley Maple Syrup Festival every year and everybody came every year to find those. I'm going to highlight some of these other programs below as we go through in the slide deck that I have here. The Envirothon, uh, many of you may or may not have heard of, has, was established uh, at least since 1994, and it's a unique environmentally themed academic competition that immerses students in hands-on learning and discovery. And there's four main categories to that. There's the wildlife, the soil, the aquatic, and the forestry and these five this five member team from high schools or from other environmental uh, minded groups whether it's from churches or uh, 4-h groups come together and they learn on all these aspects and then they they compete against other people in the area so uh, stewardship great bruce hosts the envirothon and we provide that form for the great bruce county so you can see the pictures here uh, at the end of the event as they come the kids come together and celebrate the day um, there's always going to be a winner, and uh, we always have uh, um, the Spirit Awards too, and it's a quite a fun day. So the themes on the, the, the left-hand side there, you see the, the individual there, he's looking at soils maps, so he's got to answer um, the sheets on questions on soils. Um, habitat is another theme, as I say, the wildlife, uh, forestry. So the kids come together, they compete. Now this year and last year, and this year they're calling it a hackathon. Um, registration is open and I'll give you the website in the next slide there. Uh, payment for that is $50 per team and it's all virtual and, and everybody gets to participate in this case because the way that the system has, has changed. So and anybody who wants to pull together a five person team can certainly talk to uh, Stewardship Grey Bruce directors and see if they need to have support to get to that uh, competition or we can help direct you to that. The Roots of Bruce and the Grown and Gray uh, have been going on for many, many years. And grade five and six students from across the two counties uh, attend these activities to raise awareness of the importance of our agricultural community, our forests, and are, and are all part of that. And you can see on the top left, John Black, a former educator in Bruce County, is engaging students uh, there. He's got some wood blocks. He's going to go through um, various aspects of the trees. And he also has um, a set of furs that's been talked about. So not only does the agricultural community have the, what you're growing on, on the landscape, but you've got your, your ecosystem as a whole, the forest, the back 40. It's all important to um, the landowner that he keeps everything healthy. And Stewardship Grey Bruce, we participate in both these events and we bring forward, um, our, our, we also give them financial support as well from year to year. But you can see in the bottom right picture there, this is one from the uh, Roots of Bruce, the, the numbers of students that come together to learn and educate and empower themselves with what's going on in the community. Another aspect of Stewardship Grey Bruce is improving our ecosystem health and our riparian corridors. Um, we support many projects. The Deer Creek project is one that's been ongoing for a number of years in Bruce County. And, and by doing so, by improving our, our stream corridors, we're also improving our ecosystem health in those areas. Um, Stewardship Grey Bruce has also supported the Grey Sable Foundation Arboretum in their activities, um, as well as other projects that the Grey Sable and the Soggy Conservation have been involved with. Um, they've also provided funding uh, for plantings within the watersheds, individuals who are doing um, Planting that in property so that they can access the funding for that. So lots of trees have been planted and stewardship Grey Bruce is, is there to help. Livestock exclusion, as Keith had talked about with the Alice program, we've also partnered with Alice 
and as well as with the Resolve for um, exclusion fencing of the Upper Sobel River, and as well as some tree planting in the Upper Right. And you can see the, the children uh, planting trees along the, the Otter Creek property there. So lots of partnerships going on, lots of education. The youth, 17-year-old, uh, if you're in that age, age bracket and you'd like to learn more about uh, what's involved in the environment, you can apply to be a stewardship ranger. And that's typically a program run by the Ministry of Forest, Natural Resources and Forestry. And Stewardship Grey supports that program through um, outreach with partners in, in our community to help them uh, have projects set up for them. And uh, we also help with work boots, um, make sure that they're, they're planting safely and working safely. So for Stewardship Grey Bruce to be a part of that, it's always been integral to our framework to support the youth in learning about ecosystem health. But we have to learn about our own health as well. And as board of directors, we participated in a forest health therapy. So we want to make sure that our directors are engaged and in tune with the work that we're promoting in our natural environment so we can continue learning in these activities. A couple of other important projects that Stewardship Grey Bruce support, uh, the Grey Bruce Children's Water Festival. If you have a grade four student in your home, they have been to Chesley to see the uh, water festival activities. So pretty massive tents in that area behind the arena and close to 100 different stations that the students will go and learn all about um, water. But what's important to that, again, is the education, um, having our, our youth come through the system so that they can appreciate and understand what's important uh, moving forward. You can see there's, as you go through this uh, video, you can see the different um, websites, websites there you can pause and, and go directly to those. The Bruce Gray Forest Festival for grade seven. Um, 33 various educational stations for grade sevens in, in and across, coming from across the two counties, throughout 100 acres of the classroom, and that being the forest. So at Allen Park Conservation, uh, these students come together and they have um, environmental students or geography students from high school who are teaching them. Uh, so the youth are teaching the youth about the forest and about the benefits to having a healthy forest in our, in our landscape and on our water, in our watershed. And Stewardship Grey Bruce supports these programs both financially but also with volunteers to assist with the logistics of the day. Youth Expo is another event that Stewardship Grey Bruce is proud to be a part of and support. Uh, it's air, experiential learning for children. Uh, they can learn how to fish, uh, identify birds, understand what bugs live in the streams and creeks in our aquatic system to support that uh, living system. Um, they learn how to, to uh, pull a bow and, and to fire that. So lots of good activities that happen uh, once a year and the Sydney Sportsman Association, which is outside of Old Sound, offers their property and they also offer many of their volunteers to help us with that. But usually at least 70 um, students are, or children from ages 10 to 17 will participate and we have at least 25 volunteer adults who we need to help run that to, to do it in a safe manner. So we appreciate uh, the support that that the Citizen Sportsmen give us and for Stewardship Graders is the lead on that program. So overall, um, Stewardship Grey Bruce, we do have a heavy hand when it comes to ensuring that our youth are educated and understanding what's important to them on the landscape so that as they get older and become uh, adults in our community that they know that they need to give back and support. Um, our information is located there, uh, stewardshipgraybruce at gmail.com. You can also visit our website for more information on these, uh, these programs and certainly reach out to us. Thanks, Nancy. Let's over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Joanne. That was really, really excellent. Um, I love that, um, you know, having kids myself, I know that they've been involved in some of those programs. So um, that was, uh, it was nice to see them highlighted. Um, so we're going to uh, go on next uh, with Nora's presentation. to understand how to wisely use agricultural and rural properties and this explains her involvement with stewardship Grey Bruce and while at the same time ensuring we maintain resources that are protected for future generations. Once retired from Ontario Parks uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry Nora was able to give more time 
uh, to her interest in endangered species and their habitats. And this led her to becoming involved in the outreach, education, and stewardship aspects of the piping plover recovery. Nora is an avid birder, a uh, supporter of volunteerism in the community and a champion for the Sobble Beach piping plover. She is a plover lover. And today Nora will share with us a little bit more information about these little birds. And I'll turn it over to you, Nora. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I'm really Im impressed with uh, Keith and, and Joanne. And, and part of what we do is we work together to enhance and widely use our natural resources and agricultural resources. And, and I'm just pleased that um, they're part of my crew. Stewardship Bray Bruce um, was the recipient of a, a grant through the Species at Risk Stewardship Program. And this grant addressed out, um, outreach, education, and stewardship actions found within the recovery strategy for the piping plover in Ontario. We formed a committee, the Stewardship Bray Bruce did, and plover lovers became our on the beach or in the community name. In non-COVID times, we would have a coordinator who oversees the, the various aspects of our program. Um, they would be working with a suite of volunteers. They would be monitoring the piping plovers on the beach to identify the individual birds and noting their behaviors. When needed, they would identify locations of nests and pass that information on to the biologist. They would record information which can be used to expand the life stories of each bird or family on the beach. Sometimes they would be involved in educating people on the beach or in the community, in schools and beyond. And um, at, from time to time, they would assist in the placement of peri perimeter fences and nest exclosures. 2020 COVID restrictions resulted in the cancellation of our volunteer program and therefore, we turned our efforts primarily towards social media and education. Volunteers and others fall in love with the chicks. 28 days after the last of the four chicks is laid, the chicks hatch. They're about the size of a ping pong ball when they hatch, but similar to other plovers, they're precocial and able to walk or run right away. Parents must brood the chicks to keep them warm. Chicks are not able to thermo, thermoregulate and therefore must find an adult to snuggle under every so often, even on a warm, sunny day. And there we are. Chicks are usually banded within the first 10 days after the hatch. All known piping plovers on the Great Lakes have been banded with a unique set of bands. Bands tell us where and when they hatched and who their parents were. The best view is always from the back end. This is OY163XYOY. Quite a mouthful. Volunteers, the committee, and the public have difficulty remembering a bird by its bands. For this reason, we've chosen to use reference names to simplify the identification and the thought process for some of us based as much as possible on the band combination itself. Lots of yellow resulted in sunshine. We call her, her Miss Sunshine, and she's returned to Sobble Beach every year since 2016. I know some of you are saying these volunteers are guilty of anthropomorphism, giving human traits to a wild creature, in this case, a piping plover. I'm going to defer to Jane Goodall, who is known internationally for her work with chimpanzees. I quote, when I got to Cambridge to do a PhD, I was told I couldn't talk about chimpanzees having personalities, minds capable of thinking, and certainly not emotions. You know, I was guilty of anthropomorphism. But fortunately, though I was really intimidated by these clever, clever professors at Cambridge, I'd had this wonderful teacher when I was a child who taught me that in this respect, they were wrong. And that was my dog. You know, you can't share your life in a meaningful way with a dog, a cat, a cow, a bird, I don't care what, and not know, of course, we're not the only beings with personalities, minds, and emotions. Oops, too far. Building an observing, and, um, an observing personalities on the beach, 
we have found that one of the best ways for people to learn about the piping plovers is to study their profiles. And what better way than looking at how they might appear on Facebook? There are many human uh, love stories attached to Sobel Beach. But today, we're going to take a glimpse at a piping plover love story. This is Mr. Blue Bands. Many piping plovers do not return to the same site where they were hatched, but he did. He's been nesting on Sobel Beach since 2017. As a youngish dad, well, he was almost two, he really was what we would call a deadbeat dad. We would frequently hear Ms. Green Dots, his mate, peep up for him when he had left her incubating eggs for longer than the usual half to two hour interval. Both adults share the duties of attending the nest. And well, blue bands seem to have more interest in arranging the furniture, shells, twigs, any related debris around the nest itself than he did in incubating eggs. In fact, he was observed rearranging the nest site so much that he accidentally kicked an egg out of the nest. This was immediately followed by him kicking it back in. This was of course before it was noticed by Ms. Green Dots who was foraging nearby. They were an item for three seasons. Each spring, Blue Bands has arrived at Sobel Beach on cue around the end of April. In fact, he was observed on Sobel Beach this past spring when the beach was briefly open. Once a piping plover has found a beach they like to nest on, they develop a strong fidelity to that beach. This reminds me of people who find a vacation destination and year after year return. Sobel Beach is certainly popular for this. Piping plovers also return to the same wintering grounds every year. I don't believe that Mr. Blue Bands has ever been reported on his wintering grounds, but many of the Sobel Beach piping plovers winter on the Gulf Coast of Florida. I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story about site fidelity from Michigan. Each spring for 15 years, Old Man Plover returned to his birthplace in Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. He was punctual, arriving back from winter migration on the same day. In 2017, he arrived on the same day even after a side trip to Port Dover. This champion of the species hatched in 2002 and was banded as a chick. In the spring of 2017, his mate from the two previous seasons was late returning. First, she visited Presque Isle Provincial Park, which is 420 miles east of her usual destination. It seemed as if she was trying to get her bearings, traveling next to Wasaga Beach, back to Presque Isle, and then directly to Sleeping Bear Dunes. Unfortunately, old man Plover got tired of waiting, and when she arrived, he had a new mate. Old man Plover was predated before his final nest hatched in 2017. He'd outlived most plovers by a decade. He was 15, most plovers eight, or age five is really old, and had fledged an average of three to four chicks per season for 15 years. Pretty impressive. But back to Mr. Blue Bands. Oops, oh dear. After that first summer of being a deadbeat dad, Blue Bands changed his tune and was observed being a very attentive dad. He preferred nesting close to the north end of the beach and then moving his chicks slightly south. We know from our observations that some chicks stay close to the adults. Others move about the beach and increase their range greatly within the first week. In some cases, the adults will move their young to another area of the beach. This is mostly most likely to find richer food supply in the rack line adjacent to the water or perhaps in the new, nearby dunes. Like any good dad, he distracted predators like gulls away from the chicks when they were most vulnerable, which is usually up to about 12 days old, and warned his chicks by piping at them when danger was near. We often observed the drills where he taught his chicks how to hide in the dune grasses or crouch down when predators, especially merlins, crows and gulls were near. He even equally shared incubating and brooding responsibilities with Miss Green Dots. 
And then there's his mate of three years, Green Dots. Ms. Green Dots hatched in Michigan in 2015, and it's been nesting at Sawell Beach since 2016. That was a tough year for her, as in quick succession, she lost two mates to predation, and since incubating eggs is a too plover job, she abandoned both nests. Laying eggs is a huge energy investment for a female. Each egg is around 10 grams when laid, or that's about a fifth of an adult female's weight. Both adults incubate these eggs about twice as long as most songbirds, resulting in the chicks being fully feathered and ready to go when they hatch. The next part of her story after she, she returned to Sobble Beach in 2017 became much positive, more positive after all, she'd found blue bands. This Sobble Beach love story continued for the next three seasons, 2017 to 2019. Due to COVID related beach closures, we don't know if she got made it to Sobble Beach in 2020. But we do know that for three summers, green dots and blue bands would arrive on the beach within three days of each other. He would make a number of scrapes in the sand and she would select one of them. She would lay four eggs over a seven day period and then share domestic incubation duties with blue bands as she simply couldn't do it alone. Once her eggs hatched, she and blue bands would try to keep the chicks warm and safe. But unlike human mums, after about 14 days, she would feel the urge to migrate south, leaving blue bands alone to be with their chicks until they fledged. At Sobble Beach, we know that a full clutch nest was found abandoned on June the 9th this year, or in 2020. However, we don't know who the parents were. We do know that for some unknown reason, Miss Green Dots abandoned her fidelity to Sobble Beach and nested on North Manitou Island in Sleeping Bear Dunes, about 15 miles as the crow flies from where she hatched in 2015. The migrations of piping plovers remain a bit of a mystery, but it's documented that a female was slight, sighted in Sleeping Bear Dunes, Michigan, at, they even have the time here, 10.15 on July 22nd, then 44 and a half hours later, on the morning of July 24th, she was photographed near Miami, Florida. This is a distance of 1,385 miles. So if she'd left immediately after being seen in Michigan and arrived just before being photographed in Florida and flew a straight line to her destination, she would have averaged 31 miles per hour. You can see here that piping plovers lose that that uh, black neckband that they have in the summer on Sobble Beach when they're wintering in Florida or elsewhere in the, in the south. This summer, with no successful nest on the beach, the Piping Plover Committee moved its efforts to enhancing the outreach and stewardship materials we have. Plover Lovers produced a 28-page activity book and Piping Plover activity sheets for younger children we developed lesson plans and resources for teachers and upgraded our website. It was a busy fall and winter. We have developed a lot of resources, but there's still room for people to help. COVID makes it difficult to plan in the long term. However, I really want to encourage beachgoers to share your stories and ours about the pipe and plovers. Please enjoy our Love the Plove video.
What a cute little video. Oh my gosh, I just love those little birds. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Nora, so much for the for the presentation. I, I, I do how, love how you did it. You, you really brought them to life and sharing their story. That was, that was really, really fantastic. Um, so we have had a couple of questions submitted uh, through the web form. So uh, if you don't mind, we'll just take a minute and uh, look at those. Um, so I think uh, the first one is from the Owens Sound Field Naturalist from uh, Jan. And uh, this might be best directed to Nora, maybe. Um, it says, how is the private and public land owners uh, doing managing their properties in Gray Bruce. I'm thinking of stewardship of privately owned residences and farms, uh, nature reserves, indigenous communities, municipal, county, provincial, and federal parks. So that's the first part of the question if somebody wanted to take a stab at that. <laughs> I'm wondering if maybe Joanne would be more uh, in tune with answering that one. Sure. Okay, um, I can take a shot at it. And it's a multifaceted question. Mm -hmm. um how are the private lands and the private landowners stewarding their lands yeah like uh keith has said a lot of um initiatives that we do is voluntary and so i feel that uh, a lot of them are doing what they can we're we're actually um it's getting tougher and tougher each year i believe for each conservation authority in, in the grand bruce counties to find uh landowners uh to to, to plant trees and i think it's more of we're maybe getting a little more, um, not as many spaces to plant where it, it best suits the landscape outside of the agriculture and, and along. We've done the riparian uh, plantings, perhaps the block plantings in those small corners. So I think as individual landowners, they are stewarding the land. They are doing um, managed forest tax incentive plans for their uh, properties so that they can best have a sustainable forest. Um, the agricultural community, of course, they've got lots of uh, various parts to their land, um, and they are doing their best efforts in, in terms of trying to improve soil health. So as a steward of the land and trying to improve soil health, they're trying to uh, reduce erosion. And by doing uh, improving their soil health, by improving organic matter, um, by leaving the soil covered, whether it's living or dead, being if it's a cover crop that they grow after their main crop, and which then is then in place over winter, or they've harvested and they leave the residue or the cut uh, corn or the cut stubble in place. So they're covering their land, which helps prevent and reduce erosion, whether it's wind or water erosion. So they're, they're employing these practices, they're learning, they're going to peer to peer uh, learning groups. And in a vir virtual sense, um, if you're a non farmer, right now, the Innovative Farmers of Ontario have a forum right now that has a great list of speakers. Um, the Great Bruce Farmers Week through the Great Egg Services had a wonderful list of speakers too, which is also available online. So farmers are reaching out and they're learning, they're improving their soil practices because that is their business. If they lose their soil, they lose their business. Um, as Keith had mentioned, the livestock uh, exclusion fencing that conservation authorities partner with Alice is very important to the stewarding the land and keeping the animals out of the creek and waterways. Um, county properties and conservation authority properties. Um, I think the county properties, you know, um, they're at a point now where a lot of the um, managed forests the, um, that were planted, they're coming up for different cuts, so they're, they're managing them, I believe, the best they can. They have they have the staff on hand, uh, county forest staff, to help deal with that and look at the management plans and do the proper cutting for sustainable forests. Um, so I'm trying to answer most of parts of that question and whether um, Keith wants to add that uh, at all. Great, thank you. Um, there is a little bit more uh, to the question from Jan. Um, how are industries and institutions contributing uh, to protecting habitat? And is there any evidence of goals not only set but achieved? I, thought, I think you talked a little bit about that um, in your presentations as well. Yeah, that's a difficult question because um, we're usually at the receiving end, whether it's stewardship, Grey Bruce, or Sogdean or Grey Sobble Conservation and Alice, of uh, if industries are wanting to improve their corporate image through uh, supporting funding of initiatives. We do reach out to try to get that as well, but certainly um, depending on their goals and objectives, 
um, then they'll be the ones reaching out. Um, Enbridge has been a big supporter for education. Um, Bruce Power, as I mentioned, has been a huge supporter, not just for stewardship Gray Bruce, but, but many other. And, and right now they're actually looking at climate change and carbon uh, carbon offsetting in the, in, in the industry in terms of being a good steward and, and, and meeting climate change um, adaptations and mitigation measures. Uh, the county as well has actually launched into that as well, if you've been watching any of the information. Uh, industries, um, uh, I can't really speak as a whole to those in manufacturing and, and, and whatnot. I mean, we certainly are willing recipients of anybody who would like to be uh, a good steward and, and support initiatives on the landscape. So uh, our doors are open for that kind of conversation. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, has there been any uh, particular project maybe with um, local business or industry that stands out in your mind? Oh, I, I, for me, I think uh, the TD, the Toronto Dominion Canada Trust Banks, the TD FES fund, mm -hmm. uh, we've been planting trees 150 a year for seven years at various locations across the watershed. So they have certainly uh, made a stand that they, and across the country. Mm -hmm. So the TDFEF fund has been a great one. Um, again, Enbridge, Bruce Power. Um, anybody else want to speak up on that? I'm trying to think of some other industries. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and there just seem to be, um, uh, people do seem to appreciate that change and, and uh, looking for companies and industries when they're using their purchasing power um, and leveraging it and uh, looking for, for places that are being environmentally conscious as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Okay, no problem. Um, so just a, a couple other uh, things to mention. Um, I, Joanne, you had mentioned the Environthon, and mm -hmm. um, so when it, when is that happening again? Or is it? Uh, yeah, registration is open now, and okay. that's through uh, supported through the Forest Ontario. Okay. It's kind of the main hub. And Stewardship Grey Bruce, um, we would usually host the regional, being the Grey and Bruce regional area. Um, and I think in terms of our group, you know, we may be looking at uh, supporting individual um, groups that maybe want to go there so they can reach out to us as to um, that as a possibility. Um, the, again, five students or five um, adults from in grade, uh, grade nine to grade 12, mm -hmm. um, they do allow seven and eights grade sevens and eights to participate, but they, they can't uh, compete. It's just for a learning experience, and that's what we've done on the ground before. Mm -hmm. um, the registration, I believe, is going to be open until, I think, mid-March. Okay. And it'll be an online virtual, like they're calling it a hackathon. Great. This year. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And they usually have a special project, too, that it's not just the four categories of soils, mm -hmm. wildlife, aquatics, and forestry, but then they'll have a special question that they have to answer um, together and they may have that ahead of time they're still kind of working through some of the logistics on that and this is province-wide mm -hmm. um, it, and, it, and since we're not doing your local ones it's going to be province-wide and everybody can participate then they could then possibly get to a national uh, like for Canada mm -hmm. uh, participation competition and then there's been international and in fact our own sound groups um, from uh, Walker and District Secondary Walker, from West Hill right. uh, Secondary School uh, has gone national and to uh, Nova Scotia to participate. 
That's amazing. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love those programs that you, that you run for um, from children all the way from public school up to high school. And I think that's fantastic. Um, thank you so much for doing that. And uh, um, just, uh, yeah, so I think we'll just wrap it up there. Um, so thank you so much to everybody today um, for Keith and Joanne and Nora for taking time and sharing your information with us. Um, I think it's really important to uh, share with our, our viewers what uh, your organization's uh, focus is, uh, what you do in our communities, the education that you provide, um, and uh, hopefully inspire people to get involved and uh, and to make use of your programs as well. Because um, the more people involved, uh, the better off I think we'll all be. Uh, so for more information, please feel free to contact Stewardship Gray Bruce uh, through their website. And I believe we have that uh, listed in the description and on the screen there. Um, thank you today to our digital services coordinator uh, for looking after all of our, our technical details. Um, it's a little bit hairier when you have four people on the screen. <laughs> so there was a lot of, of uh, backroom maneuvering going on today to get us all set up and, and going. So thank you for that. Um, and also thank you to our communications coordinator for setting up our YouTube uh, event for us today and, uh, and looking after all that for us. Uh, please remember to subscribe to Bruce County Public Library on YouTube, uh, where you can find more live and recorded presentations, stories for children, activities you can do from home. And also a reminder that your Bruce County Public Library membership is free. So if you don't have a card, stop by and pick one up when we are open or grab a temporary card at getacard.brucecounty.on.ca. And check our website as well for upcoming virtual programs like next month's uh, Anti-Fraud for Seniors programs. And we have a genealogy program coming up as well. Uh, and then join us next time on YouTube when we host Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario. And that's on March 23rd at 2 p.m. Uh, so thank you again to Keith, Joanne, and Nora. Um, your presentations were excellent. And, uh, and I hope that uh, you enjoyed being with us today. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone.